Hi everyone and welcome to today's Chrissy B Show. Now modeling is seen as a very glamorous career offering the chance of quick and easy fame and fortune. Across the internet many websites offer women the chance to upload their photos and be approached by photographers looking for models in exchange for cash. But modeling is not always as glamorous as it appears especially if you're unfortunate enough to be with an agency that doesn't look after you very well. It's also a lot of hard work and sacrifice and can lead to negative things such as eating disorders. In fact, The Telegraph recently reported on a report by Harvard US academics who said that dangerously thin models should be banned from the catwalk and photo shoots to prevent fans developing serious eating disorders. They are calling for fashion houses to be prevented from using women who have a body mass index of less than 18. However, modeling doesn't have to have a negative impact on your life if you're careful and determined to look after yourself. As demonstrated by my special guest today, well-known Brazilian model Gabriela Batante. We also have our resident psychologist Dr. Audrey Tang on hand to talk about models and mental health. And still on the beauty theme, I also speak to makeup artist Ursula Jones about how to conceal dark eye circles. Now there are of course other lines of work that can cause a tremendous amount of issues with a person's mental health and one of these is working in the armed forces. So we feature a mental health channel video of veterans who are in a very bad way after experiences at war but who found help through an unusual means involving fishing. But back to our main focus today which is mental health and well-being in the modeling industry. The Telegraph reported that the average runway model's BMI is typically below the World Health Organization's threshold for medically dangerous thinness for adults, which is below BMI 16, putting them at risk of a host of health problems. But researchers are extremely concerned that young women are also putting their health in danger by attempting to slim down to the unrealistic body image portrayed by the fashion industry. MPs in Britain are currently considering whether very thin models should be banned from British catwalks after a petition calling for Fashion Week health checks reached more than 30,000 signatures. International models are often referred to as Paris thin because France is so prominent in the fashion industry. But last April, France passed a law preventing models with a BMI of less than 18 being hired, meaning a 5 foot 10 inch woman must weigh at least 8.9 stones. Designers and agencies found to be breaking the law can face a fine or a six-month prison sentence. Spain already bars models with a BMI below 18 from taking part in Madrid fashion shows while models on Italian runways must show health certificates to prove they are not underweight. Now Harvard is asking other countries to follow suit. In June, an advert for Yves Saint Laurent was banned by the Advertising Standards Authority for featuring an unhealthy underweight model. So we see that there are definitely, you know, that does have an effect on physical health, but also how are models affected mentally? We decided to ask our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang. Hi Chrissy, thank you for having me. A very important topic when it comes to modelling or any form of celebrity style career, we do need to consider mental health because of course mental health issues affect one in four of us and therefore it is very likely to be affecting somebody, even though they're on television, we think they've got a wonderful career, why should not, on earth should they have any mental health issues? But of course those careers do come with pressures. When we do co cover things like modelling, we do immediately think about things such as um, eating disorders, bulimia, and of course those pressures are within the modelling industry. Models are getting taller, sample sizes are staying the same, and that can be a real issue. But also with models, it's important to remember that their value is actually based on their look and whether they can follow directions. There is very little else involved. And when you can reduce a personality, a whole being to those two things, it can get quite frightening and very confusing for the person themselves who is in that career. This can send models running to the gym all the time to maintain their physique. It can is start eating disorders. However, it is important to remember when they talk to models in terms of research, models do tend to say that although their, their mental health issues have been exacerbated by the career, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have caused the mental health disorders. So it's important to know that distinction of even though there's a link between modeling and mental health, it doesn't mean that modeling is causing those mental health issues. 
Other factors that models face are of course things like long hours, burning the candle at both ends. It's very difficult, I'm sure you know yourself, Chrissy, that when you've got a long shoot to do, you may just forget to eat. It's not deliberate, but it just happens. You may forget to drink and that can cause all kinds of physical symptoms, which then, that can then lead to more mental health issues, unfortunately. Um, loneliness, being away from your family for a long period of time, that also can be a real problem. So it's very important for models to remember to maintain those contacts, especially offline contacts, with those people that they love. And of course, social media can be a real problem too, and that's something I'll get to when we talk about the uh, dealing with specific pressures in modeling. Thank you very much to Audrey. So it's not good to be overly concerned with your looks, but there's also nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves, so we should be balanced. So here's Ursula Jones to show us how to deal with dark under eye circles. Welcome to the show, Ursula. Hi, Chris. Lovely to have you back on. Oh, thank you. So obviously dark circles, a lot of people yeah. go through this and they don't know how to cover the, yeah. the circles and you know they appear all over the place in photos That's and right. on videos and yeah. stuff. So how, how do you cover well, them? We're, we're all gonna be attacked with dark circles at some point um, mm -hmm. whether it's the lack of sleep or just you know the more mature you get the the, the thinner the skin under that area becomes mm -hmm. and that the it's blood essentially showing up under the eyes okay. so today we're concealing dark circles like a pro okay so um, my first tip for helping that under eye area is applying an eye cream so you want to apply it with your ring finger the reason for that you've got less pressure um, than the rest of them so this okay. isn't going to sort of drag and you need to pat the cream into your under eye area like this. Are you talking about just normal eye cream? Yeah, any eye it? cream, yeah. I mean, don't spend loads of money on it. You don't really have to spend too much. It's just that basically you want to get moisturiser in this area mm -hmm. and it's hydrating that area. So when you're then applying any other products on top, it's got something to um, melt into as opposed to that eye area could be quite dry. Okay. Um, some people get that eye area quite oily, but it's usually it's quite dry. So you just want to hydrate yeah. that area. And also it's stimulating that area, so it's mm. helping the, the cells and the blood underneath to stimulate. And would you use, can you use just a normal moisturiser that you would on the rest of your face or should you use a specific under yeah, eye Yeah, I would say a moisturiser for your face may be um, heavier because they come in different textures for different kind of combinations or if your skin's oily or if your skin's dry. So try and get the creams that are um, recommended for under the eyes and that's simply because they tend to be either like a gel formula or, okay. and they're a lot thinner now, so right, it, yeah. it hydrates the area quicker. Okay. Um, so that would be my first um, tip. Second tip is choosing the right concealer for yourself because um, you know if you're under 25 you can probably get away with all types of concealers. They come in things like this so you've got your liquid concealers mm -hmm. and you also have ones that are your creamier concealers. Um, creamy concealers I would probably say avoid if you can um, because they can be really dry and under the eye. Something like a cream, it's more blendable and it's just okay. gonna look a lot better because if you already have fine lines under your eyes, you know, the drier the product, the more it's gonna mm. show up your wrinkles. So I would say liquid products probably easier for people to, to use. Okay. Um, and then also correcting the, the colors because, you know, I have clients that they say, well, I'm quite blue or I'm quite purple under the eye and what can I do to um, get rid of that? So you, you might have seen on the market these products where they have like the green mm -hmm. or they have the purple, all these different tones or even this one, which all my clients get really scared about, <laughs> it's bright orange. Uh -huh. Now the reason for this is, I'm just going to show you a colour wheel because I think this might um, show our viewers in a nutshell. So you can get these online, you can go to your arts and crafts store um, and pick one of these up. So for your under eyes, we tend to have like a bluey tone underneath. So this is the tone that you have. So you want to go directly opposite mm -hmm. and you can see the tones that we okay. have here are orange, which are the same shades as this lovely um, bright orange concealer yeah. that we have here. So don't be afraid to try different things and how you would work with this is to gently again pat underneath the eye area as gently as you can and it's all about making sure you do it in layers as opposed to thick layers that would just wipe off. Okay. So you want to gently pat this in, let this dry, that's the key to this one, is let this dry and then over that put your concealer, so your concealer right. that would match your skin tone or one to two shades lighter and then once that's on that disappears, you wouldn't see okay. that colour. So that 
that would actually then um, mask all your blue tones. And with your it, I'm just just a question about the tones, mm -hmm. though, the blue tones. How do I know what I've got? Is it you can just tell by just looking at it? Yeah, I think you would. You know, you would if you look in natural light, you you would see the the shades. So I would say you would definitely know if you're kind of green under your yeah. eyes, but I would say people would sort of fall within this bracket. Okay. So you're kind of looking at these tones okay. here that you get in these palettes, you know, you can see the yellows mm -hmm. and that's why you find that these kind of palettes tend to have these kind of shades okay. all together. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so um, another, you know, tip, if people see uh, concealers that have the, uh, if you have redness on the skin, they say green counteracts it and you can see it's because mm. it's opposite on the colour wheel. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, my third tip is to apply your foundation first because that just conceals anything that you um, you might not need concealer. Mm -hmm. So just apply your foundation as normal and then any areas under the eye or anywhere else in the face that you can conceal okay. on top. Um, and when you're putting a concealer under the eye, so this tip for always go one to two shades lighter than your skin tone because where the light naturally hits us from our uh, brow bone, it's going to be tend to be a little bit darker okay. here. So mm -hmm. you want to reflect the light. Okay. Um, and I've, I've talked about it before, but use this ring finger and don't um, drag because this um, skin under the eye is really super thin. And you know, this is where sort of our um, aging appears first sort of around here. So we want to be really gentle around okay. the eye area. Lovely. Yeah, Ursula. and I think that's all my tips. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And guys, if you want to know more about Ursula, please do head over to our website, chrissybisha.tv, and she's there featured on our homepage. See you again soon. So after the break, my special guest today, well-known Brazilian model Gabriela Batante, will be telling us all about how she takes care of her mental health and well-being in a very high-pressured industry. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone. So now I'm delighted to introduce you to my special guest for today, and that's model Gabriella Batante. Welcome to the show, Gabriella. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. Very so much. we're going to speak about modelling today, and as we said earlier, a lot of models do go through some difficulties um, once, once they start modelling because it is a very high-pressure environment. But you've managed to stay happy and healthy, so we're going to be finding out a bit later how you do that. Mm -hmm. But first of all, tell us about your life growing up. Was it difficult? Was it good? How was it? In Brazil, I'm from a very small village with 700 people. It's really oh. tiny. <laughs> yeah. And over there, I used to be very shy, very quiet. And um, actually, my parents wanted me to be a model. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to. I used to run away from people. I used to really like not even like to look to people's face. Okay. So my dad was the one who took me first. And he was taking me to the acting courses. Mm -hmm. And he used to sit and wait for me because he used to be in another city. And then he used to go all the way. So my dad used to sit there and I used to watch if he was waiting for me. Okay, so you so wanted him like around because you were quite shy. And, and yes, insecure. quite shy. And I used to play football. Mm -hmm. My brothers, they're football players. So I was quite, I was not boyish, but I was very feminine, but I want to play football. Okay, <laughs> so you still play football now, don't you? I can play, you, you can know, play. better than boys, but... <laughs> I don't play anymore because I can get like injured oh, or something. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. So obviously it wasn't something that you wanted to do, but then you, you managed to get into it. Did, did that sort of help your family, like financially and things like that? Was that, was yeah, that a, so one of the benefits? Yeah, so by the fact, we, we didn't come for a, like rich, we used to be like poor. And uh, by seeing that, my parents always like, uh, you know, saving money to pay the, my portfolios. Even people have helped me to pay my ticket or something to pay like clothes for me because we really could afford that. So always seeing that I said, you know, when I make money, I'm going to give back to my parents. So that's what's made me like go forward. And uh, when also I started like getting money, even little. So I said, OK, you know, I can get money with that because I didn't know if I could do a university or something because I didn't know if I could go outside my town yeah. for studies. So, of course, I complete my studies. I didn't do university, but mm -hmm. so that's how it was. I, so then I went to Sao Paulo and then there I started doing something, but was not so great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 
And then it starts to take off, it started to improve and you started yes, to... Yes, I was improving and I had the dream to buy a sofa for my house. Okay. <laughs> so oh, I, so used to, <laughs> I used to tell my mom, oh, mom, we should like change the sofa or change this furniture. And I even, I remember, I asked a friend, can you borrow me money to buy a sofa? And I said, no, Gabi, sorry, I can't. So in Sao Paulo, was, it's an expensive life, mm -hmm. as in London is also. So over there I was really struggling. My auntie was helping me. Mm. I was sleeping in her house and was as like three months sleeping on the floor. I mean, not on the floor, yeah. no mattress on yeah. the floor. And uh, so I left everything, my comfort at home. And, uh, but I used to be very shy again. Mm. So I used to go for castings and just stand on the door and leave. Oh, it was like that. Really? But then one day I said, okay, now I, I have to, to do something, something different. Mm -hmm. So a friend told me that she had gone outside Brazil. And then I said, okay, I'm gonna try that. Maybe that would work. And that's what I did. I phoned, I, I sent a message to this uh, manager in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And again, it was a no on my face. I asked him, uh, I want to go outside Brazil. And then he's like, who are you? You mm -hmm. don't even have pictures. And I was like, oh my God, that's so hard. So it was really hard, you know, so a lot of break struggling. Into, but then also there's other, what, what are the other difficulties that you face now as, as a model? What's the... Before, even in Brazil was the fact that I used to be skinny when I was like young. But then in Brazil also, if you be a fashion model, you really have to be skinny, skinny. Mm -hmm. And that was my problem since then. That way it's like they keep on track, like you have to lose weight. So my wow. parents, my mom was helping me the whole time. She was cooking my food and there was one time that I really lost, I don't know, 15 kilos. I was like very skinny. Yeah. Wow. So it's a lot of pressure on that. And when say for us to don't eat, it's like a torture. <laughs> <laughs> I love eating. Oh, of course, that must be hard. So, yes, okay. it was hard. What about all the other things? Because obviously you hear in the, in the news and stuff like, you know, there's all drugs going around and stuff like that. Would you say that's kind of exaggerated and that actually it happens everywhere, not just... Yes, modeling? it's because we are exposed. That's why um, people always, they say models, it's, you know, together with drugs and it's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I know many businessmen, many, and the 10 out of 10, I think 10, you know, eight are going to be using drugs and like cocaine and everything, you know, but they are not exposed. So people don't know like Amy in house when she comes with the overdose because she's famous. So everybody's mm -hmm. looking at that. Oh, artists, they all into drugs. It's a world where it's like there's a lot of offering for that yeah. because, you know, like maybe they maybe sometimes you are insecure mm -hmm. and you want to really like please someone or be, you know, be open, open up and be happy between them. So they said, OK, try this. And if you are not strong minded, you're going to try just to make someone happy. Okay. But many models that I know never touch drugs. Mm -hmm. So people have just like things about model because even I say sometimes they don't give us credit because mm -hmm. just because it's in the media that shows yeah. all the yeah, time. It's true. It's true. But it doesn't matter what, what work you do, you know, it's mm -hmm. all like um, what it's shown on TV. Yeah. What about the, the positive things? What do you love about modeling then? I, I love clothes, so it's okay. really, <laughs> I'm enjoying like going to the jobs, it's really, mm. I don't see the time, the time just go fast for me because I, I really enjoy, of course, when it's nice clothes, yeah. when it's bad clothes, I keep like, oh my God, let's finish this. <laughs> <laughs> but normally it's always like about the clothing and I really enjoy, and the people are really nice, you know, mm. when you work, there is no like, oh, uh, no, everybody's working happy, the makeup artists and the environment is very good. And also we travel a lot, Okay. so we get to see many countries. Where have you been? I have been all over. So I was in India also, I was a long time in India. You're, like you're quite big in India, aren't you? They're yeah, in really India. Like famous in India. I look a bit Indian. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> did you do Bollywood stuff as well? Yes, okay. I did a Bollywood move. And also I was everything by, by chance. I yeah. never thought I would be on a, like a TV because when I went to India, I couldn't even speak a word in English. Mm -hmm. And they speak English there, but then there's a language, uh, yeah, Hindi. Yeah. So I had seven teachers. I learned the language and still I didn't want. I used to like go for this, the, the takes. I used to be like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to be here. And then I started doing it because like the money also was good. And then, mm -hmm. but I didn't give 100%. Today I regret because I think we should give 100% in everything we do. Yeah, yeah. But it was not a thing that I wanted again. 
to be an okay. actress or uh, something like that. Now you, you, you're a lot sort of, you travel alone quite a bit and you, you know, you have to be quite independent and stuff, but how, how do you look after yourself? You know, because obviously there are temptations out there. There's, there's people that don't always have your best interests at heart, Yes. even though, you know, you, you do have those good people, but there are people that sometimes, you know, don't really want you to do well and mm -hmm. all those kind of things. How, how do you deal with all those things and, and not to get too stressed and, and feel under pressure too much? So before for the fact that my parents, me and my brothers actually, we always saw them like struggling to give us a better life. Mm -hmm. So I always I had a fear of my parents. I never wanted to upset them. So always like, you know, I used to think, oh, if I do this, like uh, people offer me, you know, like my mom would be so upset, yeah. you know, about it. And of course, like my faith keep me going strong mm -hmm. in whatever I do. But uh, there is moments that I really feel like, oh my God, what to do? Because we stay away from family yeah. most of the time. I have to do everything on my own, mm -hmm. wash my clothes, cook and everything. So it's quite hard. Sometimes I also, I meet some mothers, they... They don't work well and they don't have money even like to eat, you really? know. It's wow. really like upsetting sometimes like, but and they leave everything like to follow a dream. And I say, you know, models, they are always ready to work because mm -hmm. we never know when we're going to get to work. We don't have a fixed job. This is so, you know, you keep like waiting, will I get work, will I not? So it's really yeah, it's difficult. a lot of pressure on the mind because the parents are also waiting for answer. Please, if you're not working, come back home. <laughs> My dad, come back home. We are waiting for you. So it's you yeah. want to also show them that you are doing something like great, you know. Okay, Gabriela, if there's someone watching now, maybe a young young lady that you know is thinking of a modeling career, what advice would you give to her? I think in any work that uh, a person would do, because I don't do just modeling, mm -hmm. so you have to really like look after yourself and to try to inspire people do the right thing always mm. no matter what you do but do right don't do wrong so in any work and in modeling like everybody think it's easy mm -hmm. but you have to go through a lot to really reach somewhere or to yeah. do something you have to really sometimes just keep quiet when some a designer is just like shouting being like hyper you know you don't know what's going on it's just like okay you know if you keep just calm. <laughs> keep calm yeah. because everybody's think is like so easy but when you meet like big people mm -hmm. it's really hard yeah okay mm -hmm. Gabriela it was lovely speaking to you yes, thank I you so much <laughs> thank you and thank all you. the best for the future thank I'm sure we'll so be hearing much, lots Casey. more from yes, you I hope I come back here. yes <laughs> give us the update yes yeah? okay <laughs> sure. no problem all right, so now actually we also have um, our resident psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, and she's now going to be speaking about some of the main pressures that models face and how they can deal with them. As I've said, social media can be a real issue for models. It's very popular and it's a very good thing in many ways because you can get lots and lots of likes and people have been signed on to agencies purely because they believe that all the followers will go with that Instagram profile to that agency and in many cases that that's, can be true. However of course when you're parading everything in front of everyone for them to comment on and to look at there may be comments that will be very negative and hurtful for, meant for no other reason but to be negative and hurtful and therefore it's important to keep those two things very separate like teachers like anybody in any career where you do need a public persona and a private persona it's very important to have those two profiles have one of them to your friends and family one of them that's public and try not to read the comments on the public one the ones on the private one will often be a lot more supportive and you can be posting the same things up there of course but when it comes to the public ones the great comments are going to make you feel wonderful but that one negative comment is going to make you doubt yourself so it's very important to keep those two separate also important to you have your partner and your family understand what that lifestyle is. You may have to be seen with different people. You may have to be in certain positions with different people based on the advert or whatever it is you may be filming. And therefore it's important for your family to understand um, that, that this is your career and this is your life. And even though you may have lots of followers, lots of people making sometimes quite lewd comments about you, again, that's your career, it is not necessarily who you are. A lot of models sometimes try and keep their family out of the public eye. This is a personal choice. My feeling is that 
When a child is too young to decide whether they want to be in the public eye or not, it can be very difficult and I have seen people create Instagram profiles for their children. It's your choice to do it, but if that child, when they get a little bit older, says I don't really want to do it, it's certainly best not to force them into it as well. It's also important, as I've said before, to keep your nutrition up, keep your keep aware of your, your uh, drinking of water, all of those things which relate to physical well-being because if we're not physically well within ourselves, that can also play havoc with our emotional state too. Thank you very much to Audrey. Well, as I said earlier, there are of course other lines of work that can cause a tremendous amount of issues with a person's mental health. And one of these is working in the armed forces. So after the break, we feature a video from the Mental Health Channel about veterans who were in a very bad way after experiences at war, but who also found help through a very unusual means, which involves fishing. CB and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10 p.m. on my channel Sky 203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone. So now it's time to watch a video called Healing Waters, and this comes courtesy of the Mental Health Channel. Try and sit. Sit I know you're just so excited. I know you're just so excited to go fishing. Say so loves fishing. As soon as she sees a fishing pole, she just like, it's crazy. Go go get a fish. Go go get a fish. Yeah. Go get a fish. There's a, a lot of things that I have difficult with, like uh, just being able to hold a, uh, a plate with my left hand, having a, a rough day through, you know, therapy. You can pretty much have a horrible, crappy day, but you can pick up a, a rod and go out in the water and, you know, beautiful country, and you forget about everything. We're having the two-fly tournament. This is our uh, large annual fundraiser that we do, and we bring out 12 of our uh, wounded disabled participants, and they enjoy a great day of fishing and get to share their stories of what Project Killing Waters has done for them, and it's just our great um, annual event. This is actually my third time that I've been anywhere by myself since I started. Project Healing Waters, uh, and to, for me to say that is really something because I would never, never go any place or uh, be around a lot of people. You know, uh, being around the people still tends to give me a little nervous, but uh, at least today I can be around them and uh, and my anxiety levels don't uh, go out of whack. It's so relaxing out here. Even if I'd never caught a fish, you know, just being out here. This is what it's all about. There's fish. Fish. He may not be the biggest fish, but you know what? He's a fish. That's all that counts. To me, he's just as big as the other ones. So I'll kiss him for good luck and turn him loose. I was over in Iraq from uh, October 2005 to October 2006. I was in Baghdad. Wasn't a pretty, pretty thing to go through. And I thought that PTSD had me, you know, had me in their grips from uh, 2009 when I got medically discharged till January of 2013. All I did was uh, lay in bed. But now I have a, a healthy out that I can do every day, be it fly fishing, 
or fly tying. It gives me a chance to escape whatever problems I have, especially at night. I'm dealing with the nightmares. Um, a lot of times, if I just go right back to bed, I'll uh, I won't be able to get out of that that thought process. You know, the the nightmares will still be stuck in my in my brain. But if I go downstairs and just concentrate on tying a simple fly, I forget about everything because I'm focusing on the fly. It's just a healthy form of uh, meditation for me. This is my Picasso. You know, some artists paint pictures. This is my work of art. Here's my trash flies. Those are money. <laughs> yeah. Those are great. Whatever you pick, that, that will catch pass. Yes. Okay. I made it. See if it, may, if it works. <laughs> I uh, deployed with the uh, first time Fifth Marines uh, in the uh, invasion in Afghanistan in 2009. I have a lot of specialty doctors that I see, neurologists, cardiologists, speech therapists, occupational therapists. I mean, you name it, I, I have to see them um, once or twice a week. Two months ago, when I, when I had the, the stroke, I was kind of hitting that the end of the road where you just don't know if, if you're ever going to get get better. Project Healing Waters is the most amazing thing. Right now I take 22 meds a day, but when I'm out here I take nothing. When I first found out about Project Healing Waters, I went to my first meeting and I was sitting next to two Vietnam vets. I think we were all looking for the same thing as a, a fishing partner. Now, we use each other as a support group, and we call each other every day. It makes the healing process a lot better when it's another vet helping out another vet. It was 1967. I was just 19, going to Vietnam. The day that I got hit in our battle, uh, I got wounded, and uh, I spent two months overseas recuperating. I never got to go in the other place, and from then on, uh, I just never told anybody that I was in the service. You need me to tie it on for you? You good? Yeah. You got good eyes? Yeah, I got good oh. eyes. Here, I'll do it. Yeah, because I don't have good eyes at all. I came from a place where I would go to the VA hospital, and then uh, I'd go home, and uh, I would just uh, lock myself in. And, I wouldn't do anything. So uh, to be out of here, uh, it, it's, it's a blessing. Some of our Vietnam participants, they are in need of this program just as much as the new, younger Iraq, Afghanistan veterans. And um, Mike is a great example of that. I mean, the impact that this program has had on his life this many years away from, removed from the Vietnam War is, is pretty powerful. And you know, it proves that these guys still need programs like this. It's because of Project Human Waters that, that, that basically I'm alive. Uh, I, I really believe that, uh, that I wouldn't have uh, been around. Every year at the Two Fly, we have three of our uh, participants from Project Killing Waters come up and give their, uh, their story, their testimonial. Next, we have uh, Mike Escarcita. Wow, uh, good evening. <clears throat> I served in Vietnam in 1967 through 1968. Because of my injuries, my uh, traumatic brain injury, and the shrapnel in my back and the nerve damage I have, I was able to to acquire the benefits 
because I could no longer work. <clears throat> My program lead wanted me, uh, she asked me if I could, she nominated me for, uh, to come to this two fly and then she asked me if I wanted to speak. And I was very hesitant about talking to a large group of people. Uh, prior to Project Healing Waters, I basically was a recluse. This is actually my third time that I have uh, uh, ventured out by myself. And uh, it's because of Project Healing Waters and, uh, and the people behind it. Gotta bear with me. <clears throat> I no longer have those uh, those thoughts of committing suicide. <laughs> so to Ed, Tony, and uh, the rest of the supporters of Project Eating Waters. Thank you. You know, one of the things was that uh, a lot of the people came up and thanked me. By me talking that I actually helped them. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great Christmas. <laughs> I won't do it again. Let me tell you. Oh my God. <laughs> We're going to catch some fish tomorrow? We are. All right. We are. I'm not a very good fisherman, so. The Marine Corps is my life, and that's what I wanted to do forever. And now that's something that I uh, have to transition um, out of and um, me medically retire, and it, you know, it breaks my heart. Um, but the one thing I know is, you know, I'm, I'm not alone, and I don't have to feel alone or, or empty inside anymore. Healing Waters builds your confidence level a little at a time. You feel better and better about yourself. I think I've uh, smiled more and laughed more. <laughs> than ever before. A lot of the people that I know would tell me now that uh, when they first met me, they were afraid of me. Because they said that uh, I was really mean looking and angry. And... So now, Sometimes I feel like a, a walking clown because I'm always smiling at people, so. Every once in a while, you know, you can pick somebody out of the crowd who's yelling because every time they catch a fish, yeah, yeah, I got a big one, I got a big one, and so my enthusiasm award is Kevin gave me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You do not have to sacrifice for others as you suffocate in guilt of expectations unmet. You do not have to bear your pain or emotions to protect the lives of the Marines you lead. 
you can let the concrete that protects your heart turn to glass and let others see the true you. You can be a miracle with your words to reach others who cannot speak. You can be a new you who discovers herself for the very first time. You can let yourself feel and experience true happiness, joy, love, and a smile. You can see beyond what you can't see to achieve. This is something that uh, I'm not going to forget. So thank you very much to the Mental Health Channel for that video. And if you'd like to know more about them, please do head over to our website, chrissybshow.tv, and click on our contributors section. Well, after the break, Dr. Audrey Tang will be letting us know how models can take care of their mental health and well-being. And I'll be giving you some tips on how not to give in to peer pressure. Welcome back everybody to today's Chrissy B show and we've been discussing the pressure that models can be under in this kind of industry and how they can actually take care of themselves and now we actually have a video our last video for today from Dr. Audrey Tang and she gives her advice on how models can take care of their mental health and well-being let's take a look as I've already mentioned, good nutrition is incredibly important, whether it's to keep you going during a long shoot, whether it's to avoid um, eating badly when you're, when you're feeling lonely or feeling down and you're not able to see your family. Also drink lots of water, that's incredibly important too. And just be aware of what may be happening at these parties that you need to go to and avoid certain situations if you feel that you would find it difficult to refuse, say, recreation drugs or or something that else that's being offered during those parties it's also important as I said to keep your social media profile separate remembering what's your career and what your who you are and also of course practicing mindfulness it's it's something which a lot of people talk about but few people really genuinely do and mindfulness is not necessarily about sitting there saying oh I'm very grateful for what I've got it's 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 about appreciating the moments in your life. Now, I'm going to just talk a little bit about something I've been looking at at the moment. It's an NLP technique called through time or being in time. Now, through time people tend to be people who follow one thing after another after another. And if you're a high achiever, and certainly celebrities, models, people who are doing well in their careers tend to be very through time based because they're always thinking about the next goal, the next thing, the next, uh, the, the, the one after, and not necessarily taking the time to enjoy what's happening at that precise moment. This is in contrast to in-time people. In-time people are able to appreciate what's going on at that time, but they can lose track of time because they're so absorbed in what's going on at that particular moment. Now, through time people, high achievers, um, models perhaps, celebrities perhaps, can take a leaf out of the book of the in-time people. And that is take a moment to think about uh, it, what wonderful things are happening at that precise time. So when you are meeting these exciting people, when you're going exciting places, when you're doing exciting shoots, take that moment to appreciate that time itself. Not thinking about what's going to happen next, but actually how wonderful it is that you're doing those things you're actually doing at that particular moment. Live for that moment in time as well as thinking about the next goal. Thank you very much to Dr. Audrey Tang. So now it's time to share some of my own tips on how not to give in to pressure. And the first one might sound like an obvious one, but it's important is to avoid drugs and alcohol. So there is a lot of pressure in the beauty and entertainment industry, and we can see how many celebs end up with addictions. And maybe you say that you're confident in your decision not to use drugs or, or you know, drink a lot of alcohol, but what if it's your friend that's offering? And maybe just a simple no thanks won't be enough. So honestly, if it were my friends, I would probably just change my friends if they kept insisting uh, for me to do something that I didn't want to do and I know this isn't easy and it's you know not everyone can do this but there are other things that maybe you can do so maybe um, 
For example, you can say to the person that you're trying to stay healthy to maximize your performance, maybe like if you're in the sports industry, for example. You can also maybe take some, bot you know, some bottled drinks with you. So whenever you go out, you can, if someone says to you, do you want something to drink? You can say, I'm, I'm already covered. So, you know, you, there are sort of ways around it and you can actually make an excuse to leave at the end of the day. And there are times when you just need to avoid the situation altogether. So for example, if you know that a certain place is going to have drugs and, you know, there's, there's just going to be a lot of pressure just make excuses and excuse yourself from that situation and if you're actually you know firm in saying no in the first place it's less likely that you're going to be asked again and also if your friend senses that you aren't so sure they will actually keep kind of trying to persuade you so you really need to be kind of firm in in your beliefs and, and you know what you want to do and what you don't want to do the second point actually which is to establish your convictions so I was reading something really interesting online and it was about thinking why you don't want to want to do maybe the sorts of things that your peers are asking you to do. So you can ask yourself, do the activities conflict with your personal beliefs or maybe your religious beliefs as well? Do you think that what they're asking involves too much risk? So recognize why you don't want to do these things and then keep those convictions in your mind when people ask you to do things. And a suggestion that was given that I think is really interesting is that you can actually um, make Make your resolve even stronger by reading things that support your convictions and talking to people who share them. So for example, if you don't want to smoke marijuana because you think it's dangerous, go online and find out the risks and then you're going to have a very clear picture of the dangers. And this is actually a good place to illustrate this point with a clip from Dr. Rob Hicks where he speaks about what can happen to you if you drink too much, not only physically, but how it affects you mentally too. Hello and welcome to Doctor's Orders. I'm Dr. Rob Hicks and today I'm going to be talking with you about alcohol. Now many of us enjoy a drink every now and then, whether that's with our family, our friends or our work colleagues. It can help us to relax at the end of a hard day. It can help reduce our inhibitions so that we socialise better, you know, at celebrations and other gatherings. But we have to be remembering that alcohol is a drug and if it's misused, not only can it become addictive, but it can damage practically every part of the human body. So from a physical point of view, alcohol can damage the liver, it can damage the pancreas, it can increase our blood pressure, which in turn puts us at greater risk of heart attacks and strokes. From an emotional point of view, it increases the risk of us becoming depressed, and actually alcohol is a depressant. So if you are suffering with depression, then alcohol is likely to make your symptoms worse. And let's not forget the effect that too much alcohol can have you know, on your social life. It can affect relationships, it can lead to poor work performance, it increases the risk of accidents, and indeed can lead to you ending up with problems with the law. Thank you very much to Dr. Rob Hicks. So let's go to the third point, which is to keep your future in mind. So where do you actually want to be? What will happen to you if you give in to this peer pressure that you may be going through right now? Where will those friends be in 10 years time? So if, if you kind of, I know at the time it's tempting and like, you know, it's, it is difficult to say no, but if you actually just try and think ahead, think of consequences, think of, think of what can happen to you, if things go wrong, for example, then that should also help you to be, kind of be firmer in, in when you say no to things as well. And the fourth point is to embrace who you are. So this, this, this point is more to do with um, the social media aspect of things because there are so, you know, it's not just the direct pressure that we face from people. Social media is a huge pressure. And I have spoken about this before, so a situation that I went through, but for the benefit of the viewers that maybe are new to the show and you've just joined us, I remember um, I was in with a group of friends and this was a few years ago, we were taking photos and then a friend of mine took a photo on her phone and when she showed me, I was like, oh my God, I look so nice. What happened kind of thing? It was really, and of course she'd used a filter and I was quite new to those. It was like Insta Beauty. And then of course I downloaded it and I was just taking loads of photos and like really having fun uploading them. And of course you get all those um, comments as well saying, oh, you're so beautiful, you look so good and everything. But it's all fake. 
like because it's actually a, an app that's made your face smooth out and you've got no dark circles and it was uh, you know it got like I was really sort of happy with the comments and of course it does feed your your kind of self-esteem I suppose when people keep telling you look nice in things but then what happened one day I forgot to use the app and I took a photo of myself and when I saw the photo, I was like, oh my God, I look horrible. And then I kind of realized um, that I never used to say that about myself before when I see a picture of myself that wasn't with a filter. I never used to say, oh my God, I look horrible. But now, because I, you know, it, was, it happened to be just a photo without a filter, now all of a sudden I looked horrible. And when I realized what was happening, I deleted the app from my phone completely because I didn't want to kind of fall into that trap of, only thinking that I'm good enough if I'm, you know, if, you know, the photo's changed in some way. And that took, that took pressure off me because I thought, why should I, why should I kind of bow down to the pressures of this world and to have to look a certain way and my skin has to be a certain way to be happy with myself. So, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I've been through all that in my younger years. So why am I now going to kind of bring that back into my life? So I had to be quite firm with myself and I never used the app again for, for any photos. Of course, I wear makeup for TV and stuff like that it, you know I enhance what I have but to change my face completely and what kind of gets to me sometimes when I see very young um, women even men sometimes I see some friends of mine they they use these filters and they're young already and then when when these apps kind of um, smooth out the face even more it's like they don't have any features their nose parts of their nose disappears or and it, it, if you think about it you People know that you've used an app, so what's the point of using it in the first place? Of course, it's a personal choice. I'm not criticizing the ones that have decided to use these apps. Of course, it's fine. Or if you want to change the lighting or, or something, the, the brightness on your phone. Of course, I'm not criticizing anyone, but I'm just saying be aware of the kind of pressures that we're put under in society today. Be aware of the, you know, the, the kind of hidden messages behind certain things and, and the media and things like that that will put pressure on you to be someone maybe that you're not comfortable with. So maybe just have, have a think about that one. Well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's program. And don't forget, if you would like to get involved in the show, maybe you have a story that you would like to share or you have some comments about the program. We also love to hear what you think about the show, especially if it's good comments. You can email us on info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet us at chrissybshow or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know more about me and how I beat my past mental health issues, you can visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Till next time, bye-bye for now.